I, yeah, I, I, would, I think you answered the question I was going to ask is does that surrealism, you know, it, you can, like, we just talked about Nancy being breaking the, you know, being a meta comic and on some levels and, you know, playing with yeah. the form and stuff. Like, but if I just, if it was presented as if it were a documentary about a girl and a dog, like it might, it would be a completely different kind of story. Um, yes, if Nancy were a documentary style <laughs> comic strip about a girl and her dog, it would be very different than what we have today. You are right, Jason. <laughs> this is the kind of incisive, like, look at comics that we need in these dark times. <laughs> you've, you've just thrown me completely off, uh, uh, off my track. I'm just spinning with nowhere to land. Um, the squirrel's here. <laughs> <laughs> like, like on cue. Oh, let's give a big hand for the squirrel, everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think he's starting to be terrified of my voice. Because <laughs> you knock him off of the window when he's making a okay. lot of noise, right? Uh, I found a uh, footage of me yelling at a crow the other day. What this whole channel needs is just That's Jason yells brand. at animals segment. <laughs> Um, Wouldn't it be really upsetting if you did that and it got really popular? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that is how I probably achieve internet success, right? <laughs> Someone will do a Werner Herzog voiceover, like he yells at the animals because of the <laughs> that mankind oh. has dominion over things. <laughs> and that someone will be me. He yells at the animals because he believes that mankind has dominion over things. Get. Get. Come on. Get. This is some ominous shit. I will call to your attention that my newspaper, which I, uh, was very formative in my comics education because my grandpa used to um, read the funnies every Sunday, you know? So comic strips were like how I tried to impress my grandfather. Like, oh, if I can make, my grandpa's a normal person and if he reads the funnies, then that's how I can speak to my grandfather. Right. And this, once upon a time, we had a great comic book section, or great comic section. Right. And now um, I can't speak to the quality of it, but I think it's fucking crazy that there are not one, but two Hagar the Horribles in this comic section. We're doubling down on the Hagar, man. This is like target market for Hagar. You like how I almost like did a real segue into your job? Yep, almost. Like, do you guys <laughs> still even do? Like, my primary <laughs> job is newspaper comic strips, too. You know that. I know. I, I didn't know before I got on here. I was like, maybe I should look at what comics she does so I don't get her in trouble. Because <laughs> all I really know for certain is Nancy and um, I mean, under the umbrella of your company. Um, right. uh, <clears throat> for the record, as a child, I pretended to enjoy Doomsbury. <laughs> like who this is this hunter s thompson i don't know who hunter s thompson is <laughs> it's, but he's zany you know it's definitely <laughs> not it's not aimed at children in a lot of papers it was in the political section or the op-ed page mm -hmm. and or with editorials instead of on the comics page i'm such a um i mean i've told you a million times i think that i was a journalism major in college because i didn't have it was like half PR, half journalism, because I didn't have a plan. I, and, um, I have a degree in English, so. Right, and you know what my 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 brilliant plan was was I was gonna use my connections at the newspaper to get myself a comic strip. <laughs> if I were to send you that my comic strip and I was like, I want to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would say <laughs> that. What are you looking um, for? Well, okay, so that's that's a fair question. Um, the thing to think about is that syndication in print is more difficult than ever because of the newspaper industry being in kind of a tough spot and has been for a while. And then the current situation is not making it easier. Um, so when we look for stuff for 
for a strip, um, if the art stands out, that's awesome. Like I've had a couple submissions come in where everything was basically ready, like pretty much together. Wallace the Brave is a good example of that. And it's not, nothing comes in ready to be syndicated. <clears throat> There's always a development process, even if it's short. Uh, like Olivia with Nancy had it pretty much from the beginning, but it was still, there's it's not just about whether or not your comic is good is it's like can you do a good comic every day for a really long time yeah. because sometimes you can do like 50 really great comics but if you want to be syndicated that's not enough you have to be able to yeah, do right. a high quality strip every day for like 10 years like five to ten years at least if you're serious about it so part of what we do when we do development deals with people is we're seeing what your consistency is like and if you're able to hit deadlines and if you're able to like work when everything is really weird and terrible <laughs> like stuff is right yeah, now right so um but yeah like what we're looking for is just uh there are if i don't say marketable then and my ceo ever sees this then he'll be like i knew it I knew you didn't, I knew you didn't think <laughs> yeah, about whether that's yeah, exactly. But I mean, like that is a big part of it. Like we're, what we're assessing is, do we think that we can sell this? Do we think that this has a life at this point in time beyond a newspaper page? You know, is this something that we could see as a book? Is this something we could see as possibly like an animated series or a feature or, you know, just like what could it be? Is it merchandise? Is it licensable? Um, <clears throat> so we're thinking about it as a whole business because once upon a time we could you know you could support yourself by doing a newspaper comic and maybe not a lot of people could do that but enough people could and it was like a steady salary and you could you could really um sort of count on that and at this point if you have a good launch um you can support yourself with it but it's more like like teacher salary in a good school district you know it's not yeah. you will buy multiple houses and be rich that's so. how stupid and naive i was as i was like if i could get my comic strip in 50 papers and i make 50 cents a paper <laughs> i'll make 30 grand or something like 25 grand and i was like that's all i need in this life <laughs> 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 that's a you have a shoe old. habit to support it's very <laughs> yeah, right. important that you be able to buy all the ridiculous nikes you want <laughs> right. um oh. but yeah so the stuff we're looking for is like often humor is a huge part of it it's a really difficult sell to say we have a comic that is not funny <laughs> at all <laughs> you will not sure. laugh ever at this yeah. comic um and it's also the difference you know like do you want to do a gag strip, which is more like a panel thing, or do you want to have storylines, which you can also do in gag strips, but it's not as common. Um, some of, like one of the people who's, who does it really, really well, like uh, I will name four people who I have worked with because I feel like that's a safe choice for me. Yeah, um, so four so people that I would call out to say, like these are people who are doing a really good version of the modern comic strip. Uh, Dana Simpson, who does Phoebe and her unicorn. And I feel like she's really underrated because she is doing a funny, charming, weird strip that is covering stuff in newspapers. She had a whole week about um, OCs, like original characters. And one character was like, this is my snail Sona. And this is stuff that I expect uh, to right, see. Right, in a newspaper. Yeah, wow. in a newspaper comic strip. Yeah, it was, that was like two weeks ago. And, um, and, and, like, and she's funny and her art is amazing and it's just solid and surprising week in and week out. Uh, Georgia Dunn, who does Breaking Cat News, her storytelling is really solid and she has a way of fitting in jokes as just the density of jokes in her comics is really solid. You met her actually, but I don't know if you remember because you just won an Eisner and you were wearing your Colonel Sanders suit and you were very drunk. <laughs> that should have been a very, comic line, so. She was very charmed. Anyway, like the way that she does storytelling, like her visual storytelling is really good. So the stuff that she's thinking about. She's thinking about how color is drawing your eye through the comic and where you're going to look and how she's going to signal what's important. And there's a ton of work that you don't consciously notice when you read her work, but it's really, really good. And she's very funny. Um, and then Wallace the Brave is Will Henry. And it's about kids with big imaginations. And it's weird. Like, it's very weird. 
And all of the characters are quirky in different ways. Like it's not just, here's a bunch of quirky kids who are indistinguishable from one another. And there's the girl one and, you know, uh, the wacky friend. Um, there is a girl and a wacky friend, <laughs> but they're not, right. you know. People love to compare things to other things. So like Phoebe and the Unicorn is often like called like the, the girl version of Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, and I don't feel bad saying that because Dana is fine with it. And uh, Wallace the Brave gets compared to Calvin and Hobbes just because of the kind of art he's doing in the backgrounds and the. It's like if you're gonna get compared, you might as well get compared to Michael Jordan, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, and then obviously Olivia James, who's doing um, Nancy, and her stuff is just funny, you know. Like her her art is unexpectedly good and it's so simple that you don't always notice how good it is but uh it's like all of the little details in every single panel um they're all working to tell these jokes and that's the thing about comic strips because you have a very very small amount of space to get something across and the thing that i work with people on is to try to remember that you have multiple channels of information and what you want to do is use them all well you said she came in with it pretty prepared. It was an existing strip. Did she just say, like, I want to revamp this? And we were looking for a new person, and we wanted to, to do something different. We didn't want it to just be, um, this is a strip that looks like Nancy and has the name Nancy, because it hasn't been, like, if you're into comics, then Nancy the comic strip means something. But if you don't really care about comics, it's indistinguishable from little, like Little Lulu, basically. <laughs> like, yeah, sure. I believe canonically for Olivia, Little Lulu and Nancy are enemies, like blood enemies. <laughs> but uh, so <laughs> yeah, like, like we we had to find somebody to do it, and we tested a bunch of different people, and then we we approached Olivia because I knew that she was super talented, and my boss knew that she was really into Nancy. So uh, my boss, John Glenn, like just, she's always loved that strip. So cool. she, yeah, the way that she tells the story is that she thought it was a joke and she's like, oh, haha, ha, yeah, sure. Absolutely. I'll try it. Yeah. And this won't go right. anywhere. And uh -huh. like doing test strips, like a lot of her things that came in through draft <clears> went <throat> to, like, they were finals. They were perfect. So yeah, it's, it was um, easy. Like they kind of came in and I was just like, that's it. It's easy. We're going to go with this one because it's great. I don't. I don't remember exactly what my second question was, but I know it related something had something to do with being how meta that comic is. Is that challenging to like present a comic like that to like people like my mom who get the newspaper? Because uh, it could either be an education or it could be just like, you know, they don't read it at all. It's actually, I think that people have been really receptive to it and I think that part of that is because if you make something that looks familiar it helps people embrace weirder stuff so yeah, the fact sure. that Nancy looks as classic as it does gives her more room to do weirder things with the gag stuff because you already have the audience going you know what this is like I've seen this this is familiar I have a concept of what is happening here and so definitely there there are people who do not like her take on it like it's not universally beloved there's always going to be people who don't like it um but she's a huge fan of nancy and so she's writing a comic from the perspective of a person who has a deep understanding of bushmiller nancy um has studied all of the ways that he used to construct gags and read a lot of the scholarship about it and um and also just you know, like is is a smart person who's immersed in the world. Hold on, you froze. Oh no. Okay, you're back. Um, maybe I'm just very still. Yeah, like maybe yeah. I got spooked. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I think that in that particular instance, the thing that makes that comic great is how weird it is and how specific it is and how extremely her voice it is. So I think that there's this fine line between being aware um, when stuff is going to be really, really either controversial or unmarketable or, or stuff like that. So you try to steer away from that. But there's also a lot of value in saying like, you're a creative, brilliant person and we hired you because of those reasons. And so we're here to help guide you, but we don't want to tell you to not be weird because that would be sad for everyone like boy you that is you uh, when you're weird. that's a refreshing approach <laughs> I, I you know not that i not that mainstream comics or whatever have uh they're pretty weird business 
I think when you're when you when you have a specific sort of you know that your weirdness needs to be executed a certain way to have a chance at landing right become super protective of where the edges get sanded off my whole like the way that i approach my job is i am here to help the person who is creating the thing do the best version of their thing not right. what i think it should be like what they really want it to be i want the people who i work with to understand that I'm trying to make their stuff better. I'm not doing, you know, I'm not making edits for the sake of making edits. And when you get to a point where you've been working on something with somebody else and you can see what they're good at and what they struggle with, and they can see that things that I'm suggesting are making it better, that, you know, there's like a level of trust that has to exist between yeah. editors and creators in that kind of relationship. It's a psychiatry couch for me on some yeah. level. Thank you. Please stop. So all of the meowing that you've heard is this guy. <laughs> like yeah, he has been standing behind many. me and meowing <laughs> for like three minutes. <laughs> one of legion. <laughs> There's four. There's four of them. A totally normal number of cats. Are they? Are they? Have. Are they named death, pestilence, war, and famine? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that you live in reverse alien. You know how like she has one cat and there's all those aliens? Like you have all these cats. You need like a little baby alien. Yeah, I have protect. one xenomorph. One xenomorph that I'm very protective of. And then I have to like keep these cats from playing with it like a toy. Uh, I did want to have you on to talk about like, and this is the thing I might start doing with other people too, is to uh, talk about comics that like made an impact on you, you know, sort of yeah. formed your worldview. So that way it's not just me going like, Robocop versus Terminator is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Which I really read this morning. <laughs> I'm thinking about the, like the ramifications of that and how, yeah, like that, that makes sense. It's like, they are, they are mirror images of one another in many ways. Oh, well, the plot um, is that they come from one another. <laughs> it's uh and it's frank miller and walt simonson of all things so pretty pretty wild i can't believe it's a real thing that exists <laughs> but, um anyway uh, so like a comic that i remember uh reading that is slightly pretentious but not super pretentious when i was very small uh, we would visit my uncle's house and he had a lot of old comics. Like I grew up reading a lot of the old Disney, like the, um, especially the Scrooge McDuck stuff and um, like the Carl Barks uh, uh, Scrooge McDuck stuff, stuff. And I also like my dad had a ton of silver, golden silver age comics, Marvel and DC. So um, like I am very fond of really ridiculous flash villains. Um, anyway, he had, uh, my uncle had a copy of, like just a standalone um, Dreams of the Rarebit Fiend by Windsor McKay. And they are these, I mean, well, I was like really little, so I didn't know what Rarebit was. I assumed that they were misspelling rabbit. So I thought that people were eating rabbits and having nightmares. That's not what it is. It's bread with cheese on it. Uh, I learned this much, much later. And the, the idea is that, um, and you see this in like older fiction too, where it's like, oh, or even in, in like Dickens with a Christmas Carol. Um, where you eat something weird and then you have a weird dream and then it's because of the thing that you ate. And so that's all that comic is. It's just people having really, really weird dreams. Like a man gets turned into a pack of cards and he's worried about gambling and then he wakes up and he's like, oh, it must have been the rare bit that I ate. And that's kind of the structure of all of them. So they're big. I mean, if you've read Little Nemo, it will feel very familiar for a yeah. host of reasons, but it is that structure of like waking up from a dream and and trying to make sense of the dream and deciding that it was just something that you ate. And the visuals were really strange and interesting. And uh, I just, I really, I remember always going back to that book when I would visit my uncle's house and reading that particular sequence of comics. And then when Sunday Press Books did, um, like they did the Little Nemo stuff at first and then they did more um, like Forgotten Fantasy. I think Dream of the Rarebit Fiend is at the back of the Forgotten Fantasy book that Sunday Press did. And there's like the really big, you know, the store under your futon because there's no no space in a normal person's house to to keep a table-sized book. I didn't realize Windsor McKay like 
was one of the early animators, you know. Um, I watched that Disney Imagineering garbage for... <laughs> Can we put more Nixon in it? Like, we haven't talked about Nixon in this <laughs> right, long, yeah. and I feel like that's a real oversight. Like, anytime you can talk about Nixon, you should probably do it. It's a, surprising that the Nixon robot didn't have, like, a full-blown, you know, like, moment in that... He produced it. It's fine. <laughs> like yeah, that, exactly. that robot is the, the one who greenlit that project. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in that Imagineering thing, they bring up uh, Windsor McKay, you know, being involved in that. And maybe that's where it was. I don't know. Everything's blurring together in this quarantine world. <laughs> that's it um, the thing for me about the rabbit theme stuff is just that it's so weird and so it's it's such a different structure and part of that is because it is a comic from a much much earlier time like it's different it's bigger it's um like the rules of modern comics are completely not applicable to it and it doesn't follow anything that you would see in like you know superhero comics or anything like that too yeah. so i think that it's helpful for me now looking back to have gotten so into a comic that is not um, yeah i i forgot to do my usual uh old-timey comics caveat but it is just that like i remember loving this stuff and i read it uncritically and then you go back and you read it and you're like oh no it's very racist it's incredibly oh, yeah, racist course. so <laughs> just like hey if you listen to this and you're like i want to read these comics and then you read them and you're like these are so much more racist than i expected from that person to to yeah. just Yep, like that's just be aware, like content. Yeah, all all white people of the past were some some level of amazingly racist. Like even Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> you know, like kind of kind of problematic, problematic Abe Lincoln. That's the <laughs> your problematic fave, Abe Lincoln. <laughs> fave Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pitching you that comic strip right now. <laughs> Problematic fave Lincoln. <laughs> I hope that the end of this episode is you making those jokes and me kind of not really reacting and then it just fades to black and <laughs> that's it. Hmm, yes. Hmm. Uh, it'll just be me pitching you comic strips over and over again. That's the only reason I have you on this, <laughs> on this program. <laughs> Fabe Lincoln, <laughs> Alien Cat. It'll be good. Oh, please tell me more. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> you have my attention, sir. 